rationale kind of combining these two, or these last three, the value proposition where you're gonna get value from this company. So where you see it growing, um, your ROI, your return on your investment, and then your strategic alignment. So if you're a VC that's looking at investing specifically in technology companies, you wanna make sure that you're investing in a technology company. is to make sure that you're investing in a company that will provide the highest rate of return for your capital that you're providing for them. So if there's a company that you think would be providing a higher return on your investment, or it would fit better into your portfolio, then you should be investing with them. Um, so you're looking at those last six things that we talked about in the last slide. Um, and you're just trying to align those investments um, with your overarching strategies make sure that you're investing in that right company that's going to make you the most money. So the components of business case analysis. So you have the executive summary. So this is the summary, your kind of investment thesis, what you say you want to invest into, um, where you think you should be investing into just on a broad scale as a fund, either private equity or venture capital. Uh, your problem statement, this is once you first start to analyze the company, where you see that your capital would go where it would be allocated and how this would improve the company, where you see that growth from there. And then from that problem statement, you look at then comparing that company to other alternative investments that would use the same allocation of capital um, and comparing what you think your rate of return would be with those companies. Um, and then so you take all of those into your financial projections and then you eventually implement your roadmap. So where you invest capital, where you see the money going, um, the timeline from your entry to your exit, um, the different things that you need to accomplish during that time, and the different stages of the company's growth and life cycle. Um, and then risk analysis is just going to play into all of these things. So risk analysis will go into your comparative analysis. If this company is more risky, less risky than an alternative investment, it will be used in your financial projections in both an LBO and a DCF. And then in your implementation roadmap, you're going to try to diminish these risks as much as possible um, in the different ways that you can do that. So you're going to have to research and analyze the company to try to quantify these risks and then go, go from there. Um, so the components. First, you have your due diligence. Uh, due diligence, you start with the total available market. So this is kind of going back to the market analysis. Um, so you look at the total available market that your company is able to fit into, the space that it's able to fill. So semiconductor industry, for example, you're looking at NVIDIA taking up almost the entire space, but you have small startups and other companies that are slowly gaining ground as well. As this total available market is growing, all of these companies are growing with it. You have the team, so the group of people that you're investing into, the leaders of that company, that will then be leading that company to the future and leading your capital and trying to invest it in the right places. The product market fit, where you make sure that your product actually fits into the market, it's needed in the market. Um, the scalability of the product, if you have something like a SaaS company where you're just distributing software versus if you're building giant trucks, it's going to be a whole lot harder to scale because you're going to have to make those factories uh, versus just getting more um, just data centers and processors for the SaaS company. The product viability, how realistic is it that this product's gonna succeed in the future? Uh, the timing, so for example with this, you're looking at billionaires 10 years ago sending satellites into space to try to make a global internet um, connection for everyone, but the cellular devices at the time, you'd have to have a phone the size of my water bottle to even connect to those satellites versus now when Elon's sending these same satellites into space, kind of with the same business goal in mind, he's able to accomplish it because the cell phones are much more powerful and are able to connect to those satellites. Uh, revenue streams, so when you're looking at revenue streams, you're looking at where the money's coming from. If you have multiple different parts of your business, if you're expanded very wide horizontally or in a single area of business, and then cost structure, your fixed versus your 
variable costs, variable costs typically coming from the amount you're producing, um, fixed costs are things that you're going to have to pay no matter what. Um, so that's just the general due diligence that you're going to do. So it's just kind of the background on the company that you should know, um, that you're going to need to know going into the future as well. So conducting market analysis, again. Um, butterfly forces model. So you're looking to build this wide economic moat, and that's where your company is protected and you're able to build it um, without the threat of other things affecting you. So you can see the five threats here on the right. Um, the bargaining power of suppliers and consumers, you're looking at that high change in volatility of your prices based on if producers, if your supply chain can't get things to you, or if your consumers, if they suddenly decrease their demand, if your price decreases significantly because of that. Um, the competitive rivalry, how easy is it to enter into the space um, same thing with the new entrance, but the competitive rivalry you're looking at, are you going to be pushing back and forth, trying to beat each other, and promoting the best new product, or are you going to be the sole provider of said product? Uh, and that comes in with the threat of substitutes as well. So this builds your wide economic boat, moat, um, where you can build your company from within. So the VRIO analysis, is another analysis of this economic moat, trying to determine and quantify how big your economic moat is. So is your product valuable? Is it rare? Is it, uh, can you imitate it? And is it organized? So when you're looking at this, you kind of see the other factors come into play. So imitatable, you have the threat of substitutes. Um, rare, you have the threat of the um, suppliers and valuable you have the demand for the consumers. So they kind of fit back and forth with each other, um, but really this is determining the size of your economic moat and where you can see it going in the future. And then swap analysis, again, another very similar version of determining your economic moat, um, just kind of going for more of the generalities of strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So another way to attempt to learn more about what's around you, what other businesses are going to be competing with you. Um, so just using either any one of these three, you can determine how big your economic mode is very well. So financial projections. So you have competitive analysis. This is when you're comparing different companies against each other and seeing how they can compete and which uh, company you should be investing into. Uh, so you have your different options that you're comparing, and then you have your different KPIs, which we'll go over in a second, but key performance indicators. So there's different metrics that you can use to evaluate each company, and different companies in different fields are valued differently. So you, in this example, it's the internal rate of return, net present value, payback period, uh, return on interest, and the EBITDA. So again, you're going to have to look, research fields, whatever you're doing, your, um, whatever industry you're looking at, whatever industries in your investment thesis, you're going to have to make sure that you find these right KPIs and then choose these KPIs to then compare against other companies that you might invest into. Does anyone have any questions about comparative analysis? So DCF, super brief overview, we'll, or we went over DCFs in the fall. Um, this is just the intro to it. So again, you're gonna have to determine these KPIs, uh, determine your terminal value, project free cash flow. Um, step two and step three and step four are all something you learn in business finance, um, which I'm just getting into, but determine key performance drivers, so your KPIs, project your free cash flow, then you calculate your WAC, uh, your weighted average cost of capital, you determine the terminal value, and then you calculate your present value and determine your valuation. Every DCF is a little different. Um, same thing with this comparative analysis. You can choose different KPIs to measure against the companies um, in your field, but there's generally accepted ones and generally more viable ones 
4-H field that you would be researching. The DCF, every company kind of has its own build out. So um, there's overviews and general steps to all of them, but they are all different in each way. And in the end, you're still going to try to determine the closest present value to determine how much you're investing and how much equity you should get for that investment. Now you got your LBO. So your LBO, you're looking at um, acquiring a company using both deck and debt and equity. So it's a question that we've probably asked five times this year. What's more expensive, debt or equity? Somebody's got to know. Equity is more expensive. So debt is cheaper, um, and that's because you can pay it out over time. And then, so the key terms that you have with the LBO is the collateral. So um, if the company does go under, who's getting paid out first, what's getting paid out, so those assets, the senior debt, and you can think of this similarly to preferred stock, the sponsor, the underwriting, and the due diligence, which we went over earlier, the sponsor being the person that's representing the company to the fund whenever you're meeting with them and discussing with them. So now risk management. So risk management can be mitigated in different ways. So you have financial hedging, contractual safeguards, and operational redundancies. So financial hedging, I'm assuming almost everyone in here is here of a hedge fund, but they're going to invest in different stocks to mitigate their risk, risk, and then they'll put options out. So options have strike prices at a buy or a sell price, um, depending if you're buying a put or a call. Um, so with that, they can mitigate their risk by buying a option where they're going to automatically buy a stock at a certain level um, if it drops to a certain level or sell it when it gets to a certain level. And these can expedite your, um, expedite your returns as well. So doing this when you're looking at investing in companies and you're building your portfolio, you need to make sure that your risk is managed. So maybe investing in the dollar as well as in Bitcoin. As inflation goes up, Bitcoin goes up. If inflation goes down, Bitcoin goes down. So you're hedging against the two and you're hoping that your valuation will go up over time. You have contractual safeguards. So this is if something fails in the company, if there's something that you're looking for to happen but doesn't happen in a specific timeline, then you're gonna question why did this fail and in the contract that you make, and that past the term sheet that we were looking at um, last week and two weeks ago, you're going to be looking at a specific contract that's more laid out and firm. If something doesn't happen that you need to, that you need to happen, then there's a penalty clause. Either you're removing someone from a position, or there's money that gets paid back to you. You get some of your equity liquidated. Um, but those could be contractual safeguards when you're investing into a company, either private equity, with private equity or with venture capital. And then you have the operational redundancies. So these are backup systems for processes. So it's like at the house if you have your backup generator. Does anyone have an idea of what this could be in terms of private equity or venture capital companies investing into a company? like how you could use this operational redundancy technique to manage some of your risk. companies within the same sector they are very similar, um, but more for the operational side. Does anyone have any ideas? Okay, so when you're looking at making these operational redundancies, you need to have backups in the people that you're going to be hiring or the people that you'll be working with. So it kind of goes back to you could connect it with the contractual safeguards. So if the sales team is doing very poorly. You may have, might have a backup person in your, that you've worked with before with your VC or private equity firm that you can implant in for a minute. 
have them bring up the sales and then hire or promote someone from that team. But typically, private equity firms and VC firms both have a lot of connections to these people and they'll be constantly implementing them into different companies where they need to see fit to kind of build that company and grow that company where they are lacking. So risk management, you need to be looking at the likelihood as well as the severity, likelihood, kind of the probability of it, um, and that you can be done through Monte Carlo analysis. Uh, we won't be getting into that, it's super deep. And then severity, how much money you'd lose if this risk actually happens. So you quantify this risk as a risk level by multiplying the likelihood by the severity, combining the two. Um, so in this chart, it's just slowly moving worse and worse. So if it's very likely and it's very severe, then it's terrible. You would never, you would want to make sure you have the biggest risk mitigation for that. So up here in this far right corner, versus if it's very unlikely and it doesn't matter to you as a company, it's not going to change very much of your earnings, your revenue, your profit, any of it, then you're not going to be too worried about it. It could be something you avoid, maybe put something small in to try to mitigate that risk, but really it's not going to affect you in the long term. So this is the fault tree analysis diagram. You don't need to try to read any of it up here. It's just more um, for example. But if there's a business failure and there's different things that could happen past that, you want to have different contingencies for everything. So when you're going into a company, when you're building your layout and your timeline for the future, your roadmap, uh, your implementation roadmap for the future with this company, you're going to want to be looking at the possible risks and the failures that could accompany that. So with each failure, you want to be looking and seeing where you can minimize that risk. And that can be done through this fault tree analysis. So now these KPIs. So KPIs, there's different KPIs that measure different parts of the company. So the company vision, you have things like the vision or the mission statement. So it's overall what the company is trying to accomplish in the entire lifetime. Uh, the strategic object objective of the company is what you're looking to do within the next five to ten years. So still kind of long term, but not super long term. The organizational KPI is right then what you're looking to do this year, what you're doing, looking to change on your balance sheet for this year, what you're looking to do for your income statement this year. Um, then you have your team operational KPI. So this is if you're looking at like the sales team. Like how many sales does the sales team need to accomplish this year for them to be successful? And then going past that, that individual operational KPI, how much does each individual need to be doing? How many sales calls do they need to be making every day for them to be able to accomplish their team operational KPI? which will then help them accomplish what they're looking for on the year, and then in the next five years, and then the next 10 years, or and the life of the company. So really, it's just kind of slowly working its way down. So you're looking at originally establishing KPI goals at the top, and then working down towards this individual operational KPI for managers to monitor that, and then move forward on that. So multiple uninvested capital is it's just simply either the present value or the future value, the expected future value, divided by how much capital was inserted into the company. So what level do you think this could be? Either with the future value or with the present value. It would differ in where it would be in the KPI creation. There's not two arrows in the next slide, but it would differ. So where do you all think that this would fit into the pyramid? If you need me to review that definition on the MOIC, I can. So it's either the current level of equity, like how much your equity is worth in the company, or what you're predicting it to be in the future to be worth, divided by how much you invested originally. So it's either one of those. You can calculate it either way, but it just has to be specified whenever you're calculating it. So 
without being with the which one would you be expecting? Yeah, so that'd be strategy A. Because typically a VC or a private equity fund isn't planning on holding a company for longer than five to ten years. Um, their company vision will be their investment thesis and then work its way down to there. So the strategic objective for the next five to ten years in the companies they'll be investing in. And then what about if you're looking at the present value of the company? Divided by how much you invested originally. I guess that would align with the <coughs> sorry the company vision. But if it's current, if it's current versus if it's the future, so why would the current oh. one move above the future expectations? So that it would be organization then. Yes, it would be organizational for the present value. Now the distribution to pay in capital is calculated by the cash distributions to investors, so either through dividends or through asset payouts, um, also divided by the paid in capital. Um, but this is current, so does anyone have any idea of where it would fit into the pyramid? Organization. Yep. Yeah. 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 Value pay cap or two million. So this is the cash that the company has on hand, realized or unrealized accounts receivable included in that, divided by the total paid in capital. Uh, where would that fit? That'd be team operational. Team operational. So what team would that fit under? So the total cash within the company would be in the accounting team, just with the accounts receivable too. It could be. Um, I thought it was organizational KPI when I made this. Um, but if you're looking at the accounting side as well, the reason I didn't put in team operational is because the cash on hand isn't only determined by them. You're going to be looking at how many sales you need to make in the future. Um, your account's payable as well, so I thought it was more of an organizational-sized KPI. So that's the general theme. And then the residual value to paid in capital is the unrealized value of the investment, so how much you think your investment's going to be worth in the future, subtracted from what it's worth now, divided by how much you paid for it originally. Um, is this strategy, again, what part of it on the pyramid would it be? And I can repeat that definition again if anything. So it's the current value of the company subtracted by the, um, or the unrealized value is the future value subtracted by the present value and then divided by how much you paid for it originally. Yes, it would be organizational because you're looking at the current value and how much more you're looking to gain in the future. So you're kind of multiplier on that that you're going to see in the future if it's worth it to take your money out and look for a higher multiplier or not. Okay, so these are value creation levers. So the value creation levers, you use the KPIs to then look and see where you need to increase value in the company. So you're looking at developing your talent and your leadership or if you need to bring someone else in to incorporate into the talent and leadership development. Um, whether that be a leadership consultant or you're just straight up bringing in new people to run your company. You have the operational improvements, market expansion, um, just expanding into the total, total available market, um, mergers and acquisitions, buying other small companies, incorporating them into your own, um, increasing your processes through there. Financial en engineering, so this could be debt restructuring. Um, if you have high levels of debt where the interest rate's really high, so if you're looking at right now with the interest rates close to 6% for the uh, typical business, 5.25 um, to 5.5% for the Fed um, with their loans, and it drops back down in a couple of years if inflation stabilizes, then you're going to want to restructure your debt so that you can yourself can reissue bonds at a lower level. So bonds, just any sort of debt that you have, that might want to be relevered in the future.
future, and then the corporate governance and stability. You're looking at companies that are green, um, that typically have higher stock prices because people believe that the governance for them, for electric vehicles, we were supposed to have all electric by 2025, right? Am I wrong on that? Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. Something like that. We, there was a goal in the past to have electric vehicles very soon. Um, obviously, that hasn't happened. But with this, the governance for it, the amount that they're going to distribute to Tesla as well and other electrical ve electric vehicle companies, they're going to be giving stimulants to those to try to grow those companies so it won't be as much on the company and the government will help them out there. So best practices of business case analysis. So you need to be going through your predictive analytics. This is the financial modeling. Um, looking at graphing your different KPIs over time, where you see them growing, where they could possibly diminish. Um, just kind of hoping to find a predictive trend in that chart. Um, again, going back to the rise of demand for electric vehicles. Um, the Porter's Five Forces, this goes with any of those due diligence checklists, the VRIO, uh, just any of them. You're going to want to analyze the competitive market, determine the size of your moat, which really can't be quantified, but you can get an accurate comparative analysis to other companies that you're looking at investing in and the size of the moat differentials. Um, then you have scenario planning, where you're looking at developing comprehensive scenario planning. So this is that fault tree diagram. So in the future, when you're looking to increase the, uh, or decrease the risk and increase the return on your investment, you're going to want to have contingency plans for the best case and the worst case scenarios in every situation. So this is a GOM chart. It plans out your entry to your exit. So these are the different tasks that you're looking to fulfill in that problem statement, different things, ways that you're looking to improve the company to get your total value out of it. Um, this isn't actually any sort of tasks, but um, so you have your different tasks, task one through five, and then you have subtasks that need to be accomplished within each, or for this one specifically, task two. But you can have subtasks. This can be a uh, hundred thousand like numbered Excel spreadsheet if you wanted it to be, but modeling out from start to finish what you need to accomplish to really get the full value out of the company. Uh, and then the subtasks where they need to be completed in order to fulfill a major or a more major part of that uh, plan, that strategic plan and that roadmap. So the most important parts of this investment thesis, when you're going back in and using this business case analysis to determine if you should invest, you need to make sure it's evidence-based using real KPIs, real numbers. It needs to be empirical. You can't have only qualitative data every time. Um, you need to have some sort of quantitative data to really be able to determine if this company is going to be good for the future. Um, you need to have clarity with the company. You need to know the full extent of what they're doing. Um, really be able to analyze and dive deep based off that. You don't want them to be hiding anything under like that. Um, for example, the bad blood with that book, if any of y'all have read it, uh, the Stanford grad that was looking at making pricking fingers to do blood tests and was completely faking the whole thing for 10 years. She raised like almost half a billion dollars trying to start this company, um, but was lying to investors and to her upper level staff the whole time. Uh, the risk-reward balance, so again, you need to look at your risks, attempt to quantify them, and then attempt to see how big this company could be. Is it going to be a unicorn or is it just going to bust? Like, you want to make sure that you analyze that and make sure that you have the risk-reward balance that you're looking for in your investment thesis and what you're looking for in your portfolio. And then going back to the portfolio alignment, so you need to make sure that this investment really matches what you're trying to do for the future. And then you need to be, it needs to be actionable. So you need to be able to make this investment thesis something that you can build this timeline. And you're able to say, this is the things that we need to fix. This is what we see in the problem statement, really what needs to improve in the company for us to be able to get our full value out of it. 
So now the tools that you can use for business case analysis. Um, so you have S&P Capital IQ and the Bloomberg Terminal. So these both pull up large amounts of financial data and you're able to go through this and then go into a statistical software program such as a SAS or SKSS program. And these are statistical package softwares or statistical software packages uh, where you can then analyze that financial data and really look to see these financial models and where it's going to go in the future. Um, financial modeling platforms, you have PitchBook and this is Thomas Reuters. I've never used Thomas Reuters, but it's highly recommended. And then PitchBook's one that we use all the time here at Warrington Ventures. It's free through Warrington. Um, again, if you need help accessing it, just let me know. Back to the attendance slide. If you didn't get to the chance to fill out the attendance, please fill it out now. Thank you all for coming. If you have any questions about Thank you. Uh, that slide with the chart about the what? So like talking about funds severity and risk, like it's risk level or a funds risk level or a company's risk level? A funds risk level. So I mean that's again where you're looking at the risk reward. So typically the higher risk, you're looking at a higher reward, but you still need to manage those risks. I don't think there's going to be a fund that's going to be taking on super severe risks, like super high risk levels without the or even possibility of very high rewards as well. Does anyone else have any questions about the slides? I think to answer your question, Grant, uh, I think if you think about like fund size, like the, the smaller a firm is, every time they make an investment, the riskier it's going to be. So like if a firm's managing only $1 million compared to uh, Andreessen who manages like billions of dollars, they're very unlikely to fail just because they have more capital to play with because that's how venture capital works. You distribute nine times out of 10 investments and those nine investments are gonna fail. But one of them's gonna be like returning the fund seven times. So you can also think about like a big bank like JP Morgan who has trillions of dollars in assets and deposits. They're very unlikely to fail, but let's say all of us group up together and put together like, you know, a hundred thousand dollar fund. We're much more likely to fail compared to a bigger fund size. So I think that's how you can kind of think of it. The bigger you are, the less likely you're gonna fail. That doesn't mean you're not gonna fail. That just means like it's very unlikely. Because we saw that with SVB and with other really big banks with venture capital funds always failing. You know, this is like, you know, like kind of like how John was mentioning. It's all probability. Like. I saw a statistic one day, it's like, you know, it's very unlikely a bear is going to attack us right now, but it's not impossible. So it's like, that's kind of, I know it's a weird example, but it's kind of how you can think about this strike. Again, I don't think they're going to take on the risk without having the possibility for the super high reward at the same time. So that's where you see the VCs going more into that yellow and orange stage versus the private equity firms saying very risk hesitant. And another note I wanted to clarify for these slides, it was like, the purpose is to kind of get you thinking like, let's say tomorrow somebody presents you a company that you might want to invest in. So like, how would you think about investing in this company? Like you'd have to put your ownership hat on. And you'd have to think of all of these topics. How are you going to buy the business? When you buy the business, how are you going to manage it? What risk do you need to think about? Um, how are you going to basically see the future value of this company. That's going to be through this kind of cash flow. How are you going to compare this company to uh, other businesses? How does it pair up to other businesses? Um, that's kind of like the purpose of the slide. Um, are there any other questions?
like with DCFs, you have to make a lot of assumptions about the future cash flow. So how can you do that when the, when the startup is so young? Yeah, the best way I can put that is, John said it nicely, it's uh, every business has their own assumptions. So the way that I would think about it is, let's just think of like a SaaS company. So let's say you're literally just making a, a ticket website. So like when you make a sale, how much of that sale is actually going to be converted into cash? And with a DCF, you need to think about how your revenue comes down to your cash. So let's just say your revenue minus your cost is your operational profit, right? But how much of that profit is true cash? Because under gap accounting, you have to accrue revenue through like accounts receivables, accrue costs through accounts payable. So you have to think of what things need to get added back to your revenues or taken out of your revenues in order to get truly down to your cash. So for a SaaS business like that, you might have, okay, let's just take Netflix for example. They receive a bunch of cash up front every month on a recurring date, right? Because you're paying membership. So like their revenue might be a good, how can I say this? It might be a good gauge for what their cash is. But for, uh, let's see. Like what's a business that you basically sign up for but you kind of wait to, to, to pay off the cash? That's basically what I'm trying to say. You need to think of how the company actually converts revenues into cash and then once you get a good idea of what true cash is, you project them into a, a growth rate. So like let's say 5-10% and then you discount them back after 5 years under a risk-free rate, let's just say 3%. And that's a good gauge of what the value of a business would be. You can also look at different growth rates for different milestones that they need to hit with the capital they're raising and just the different fixed assets that they're going to need to have. So if they need a certain amount of money raised to be able to increase their market share to the next stage, then you're going to have those roadblocks as well. So you're going to have to implement that there just with different growing rates or growth rates. Did you get that? Any other questions? One more concept I want to leave you guys with is uh, this concept of uh, mutually exclusive, collectively exhaustive. I took a case class here at UF uh, that actually teaches you a good amount of this very concept and I highly recommend anybody to take it. Uh, it also improves your PowerPoint skills and that's largely in part how I improve my PowerPoint skills. But basically the concept is in short BC. So think of a, let's say we're all trying to decide what we're trying to eat. So like, Restaurants, for example. So, what are all the restaurants you can think of? Three, just name three off the top of your head. Uh, uh, BJ's. Okay. <laughs> uh, Kane's. Kane's. And uh, Chili's. Okay. Now, can we all agree that those are three different restaurants? Okay, so those are mutually exclusive. Will you guys say that those are the only restaurants in Kane's? <coughs> so, it's not collectively exhaustive. We can sit here all day and think of all the restaurants like, in Gainesville, but that'll take forever. The point is, when you're thinking of the different risks a business might present, you have to think of all the risks that are mutually exclusive, but at the same time collectively exhaustive, which you might imagine will take a long time. But that's basically how you need to think of business case analysis. How is, what is everything that can possibly screw me over? So that's basically what I want to leave you guys with. Short for MISI, I, would, I highly recommend you guys to research it later. It makes you much more adept at understanding businesses and also really hones in your understanding of uh, Porter's Five Forces. Those two concepts are basically in tandem together. <laughs>